Good afternoon, I think. With that length of introduction, I probably can see libraries have no future and it's time for the break, but that <laughs> probably is not what I'm here to do. Uh, the most important thing about the future is understanding just how different it is going to be from the present. In a world of rapid and constant change, thinking about the future to me is a core competency that creates organizations that are more resilient, more nimble, more vibrant. In a world of abundant data, ubiquitous social media, participatory platforms, where impossible dreams can become overnight realities, traditional strategic planning tools are kind of obsolete. In this presentation, I want to explore some near-term futures for research libraries in the context of a changing and arguably confronting environment. And I want to focus on two broad but hopefully related themes, collections and the products of digital scholarship. In doing so, I want to make use of a futures framework. The one that I've pulled out for this presentation comes from the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. I find this a very helpful framework because having certainty about what will happen in the future is impossible. But we can all benefit from thinking about what might happen and explore the possible implications of different projected futures. The ability to look forward, make informed projections about the future is important when we are setting strategy, making plans, and evaluating different courses of action. And this might help us visualize what the future might look like, thinking about the drawbacks and benefits of different possibilities, different options. It's not about predicting the future, it's about minimizing surprise. So one way that I can do this is to begin to pull out different deck cards and I could think about the different signals and drivers and how we might frame change, perhaps map out some alternative scenarios and build some resilience into our planning. But I do think that perhaps the best place to start is by looking back to look forward. Getting some historical context to help us think about the future by exercising our brains, looking back to how we've handled change in the past and anticipate how we might handle change tomorrow. One of the biggest things I've learned at this conference has not been so much about catalysts and communities, but the ubiquitous significance of artisanal toast. <laughs> I was going to lead into a, an exploration of industrial revolutions, and I realized, well, we had artisans before we had industry, and there's a lot of good stuff behind artisanal work, toast especially. Um, but I don't have time to explore that too much, so let's move into the industrial revolutions. And, and, <laughs> And I, I, I've always struggled with the, this box that I, I've used these slides in, in other settings, and I've always struggled with what to put in, in the pre-industrial box. Now I know what to put in. But, <clears throat> you know, let, let's think about how industry has evolved. You know, in, in the late 18th century, we had what commonly we think of as the Industrial Revolution, uh, steam, mechanical production. And in turn, late 19th century, we had the evolution of electricity, assembly lines, mass production, commonly known as the second industrial revolution. Second half of the 20th century, we had electronics and computers, the third. 2010s, we've had the growth of artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, and so on, the fourth industrial revolution. I think we are beginning to hear a lot about the fifth industrial revolution, the impact of sustainability, environmental issues. We're certainly seeing a lot of that in the news at the moment. And I'll come back to that one in a moment. But if we think about how libraries have handled these different revolutions, we've seen a fairly steady relationship. In the first industrial revolution, we saw libraries that gained a place in their communities. In the second, we saw innovations, things like the card catalogs, printed indexes, library architecture based on weight-bearing stacks, all of which responded to the industrialization of printing and the growth of the university that brought about a large increase in the volume of scholarship. In the third industrial revolution, we saw libraries adapt once again. Card catalogs became OPEX, uh, printed journals became 
electronic journals, and so on. In the fourth industrial revolution, things like cyber physical systems, the internet of things, um, the data deluge are all critical, and we need to understand what that might mean for us in libraries. I don't think we've completely formulated our response or our position, and that is a critical task for us moving forward. Apart from Tsinghua in China, Carnegie Mellon is the um, most prolific. That I, I hit the, the forward too quickly, but bear with me. Uh, <laughs> That you can guess which one shouldn't have come up straight away. Um, <laughs> we, are, we are the world's second most prolific university in terms of artificial intelligence research, and I have a whole gallery of pictures where there's always something about the brain and humanity. And it's impossible to find an AI image that doesn't have a brain and something really intelligent. And I really struggled to um, find one, but um, <laughs> some success. But. Uh, <laughs> Enough about him, that's my political joke, my, my one political joke for the day. Um, over the last five years, AI and automation have seen unprecedented advances in speed, performance, and scope. But I think that it's absolutely critical that we ensure that today's technological innovations make a constructive contribution to social, environmental, economic challenges facing the world. If we look at these through the prism of the sustainable development goals, we can identify risks, we can certainly pinpoint the possible negative impacts of new innovations, and the ways in which we can respond to manage the downsides and leverage the many benefits of the fourth industrial revolution, I think is something that libraries can play more than a tangential role in doing. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A at the end. Continuing with this, this toolkit of thinking about the, the future through foresight approaches, in a time of rapid innovation, signals of change are all around us. And the challenge is to see the big future trends that emerge from sometimes weak or very early signals. And my overarching theme is one of thinking about the future and building strategies that can meet our wider institutional and wider coordination partners' needs. So as we think about where we're going, um, we need to recognize that a library, certainly in a university environment, is part of a number of external worlds. We can't simply look at what's happening in library practice. We need to understand where higher education is going, where research funding is going, technological innovations, and so on. For many of these sectors, there are a gazillion consultants' reports, think tank documents that help give us the signals that I mentioned a moment ago. In the library environment, we don't have quite as many. I, I haven't seen um, Deloitte or PricewaterhouseCoopers put out a report on the future of libraries in the way they do about the future of everything else. But we do have one salvation. We have this almost this tribute band of a seemingly never-ending series of reports from OCLC research. And <laughs> I, I, I stop soon, don't worry. Um, but these, these really are important documents in the way that they can give us a bigger picture. Um, one of the great advantages of OCLC is its global presence. And having worked in a, a number of different countries, I've certainly come to appreciate that there are innovations happening all around the planet, and we need to be on top of those. But from any individual university campus, you're either going to absolutely wreck the environmental stuff by spending most of your life on an airplane, or you need somebody else to help you join those dots. And the OCLC report series does a great job of pulling out what's happening in different parts of the world. So let's delve in a little more deeply and start off with this very influential report on the future of universities and the role of libraries. And it, it doesn't pull any punches. <clears throat> and it certainly says what I've been saying for a long time, therefore it is a good report, and that is <laughs> that collections don't matter anymore. This notion that a library can be defined in quality terms by how many books it has, has had its day, thankfully. 
Services are what matters in the library of the future because it is the interactions we have with our faculty and students that allow us to add value to the university enterprise. The report goes on to talk about the, the different focal points of, of universities and this topology around research, liberal education and careers and recognizes that any university will have a blend of each of these three, <clears throat> but where it is positioned will differ based on academic programs, student profiles, and so on. Just as, as a way of conditioning the remainder of the presentation, I should mention that my university is in the top 10 most research-focused universities surveyed, and therefore a lot of what I say will be from the perspective of a university that has a considerable degree of research intensity. There is a very nice library services framework which maps out um, the different opportunities libraries have to contribute to their institutional missions. And these can serve as a very good checklist as we think about planning activities. And I think there's a, a very nice, perhaps intentional, I, I don't know the, the planning process behind this, but a very nice relationship with the um, focus of this conference, because so much of what is in that service framework can be mapped to how we meet user expectations, how we have impact, the role of technology, and the importance of networks. So if we dig into libraries a little more, the central purpose of a library is quite simple. It is to provide a service, not to provide a collection, but to provide a service, which is primarily one of access to information, which historically existed in collections, I will concede, and to enhance and improve the discoverability and usability of that information. But changes in our landscape over the last 25 years of, or so have seen a couple of flips. And Lorcan talks about these very eloquently. The first flip is how 25 years ago, the researcher organized their information workflow around the library. They would make weekly visits or daily visits to browse the latest journals, to copy conference papers, to check out books, to stay on top of their field. Today, in most disciplines, the researcher accesses and works with scholarly content entirely outside the library. Sure, we pay the bills in many cases, but their research workflow takes place outside the library. And if we are a service organization, we need to ensure that our services fit into the researcher workflow. And I use researcher to include students, not just faculty and, and other members of the research community. The second flip is that our traditional role in a collection-based information world was one of acquiring content from outside. We used to buy content from outside in the form of books and journals and bring that into our campus community so that our students and faculty could absorb what was happening in their disciplines. Today, whilst we still do some of that, there is a second role, and that is of helping our community members contribute to this cloud of scholarly content that exists beyond a library's shelves. Talking of clouds, but this is a very tangential leap. Um, if I think about how libraries have evolved over the course of my career, I certainly came in at, at a point when libraries were collection-centric, big buildings full of books and journals that served the university community. But as technology emerged in the early 90s, we became more client-focused. We were bringing in computers to help people search CD-ROMs. Some of you might remember those. Um, and that happened alongside a time when we were focused on total quality management and customer service focus. We even had to train librarians to smile rather than to scare, as Skip told us yesterday. And then more recently, we've become you know, experiential. We've had to design for enhancing the student experience, providing high quality facilities for study. We've become connected parts of a global node of information hubs around campus and indeed internationally. And more recently, we've become this interdisciplinary convening place, um, creating digital and phys physical maker spaces, 
collaborative studios, other facilities that allow students to view the library as the primary non-classroom academic space on campus. The place where they come to do serious work and they want serious space and serious quality space to make that happen. The clouds in the preceding slide were more than simply showing that I can use clip art, but rather a metaphor perhaps for changes in the media landscape and a world in which much of our media consumption has moved to the cloud. And I think it's a fairly brave library director who takes the view that all of that has happened in another sector and our role is to remain this physical information hub. Because clearly, people at large, most of us, have seen our media consumption shift to a cloud-based environment. And whilst certain library collections will remain important physical resources, our community members have sent a signal that digital content is where they are heading. There's nothing surprising in this if we look at numbers. Now, Carnegie Mellon, as you hopefully have worked out, is based in the city of Pittsburgh. And therefore, I created a P-index. <laughs> Took the, which could sound bad, but uh, <laughs> if, you, if you take the five ARL libraries that begin with the letter P, Penn, Penn State, Princeton, Pitt, Purdue, and, and I created a simple index based in year 1995 of the two things that libraries traditionally did for their university community, lend books and answer questions. And you can see a fairly steady decline. We need to think about how we interpret that. On the one hand, I've heard some colleagues say to me, we need to figure out how to change the curve, how to move it back, because clearly people are not appreciating what we can do for them and let's make sure we add our virtual reference numbers to those reference questions to, to keep the numbers up. Um, I worry that perhaps we need to recognize that at the end of the day, our job shouldn't be to save the library. Rather, it should be about providing a service that can help our students and faculty more effectively, more conveniently, more affordably do a job that they need done in their academic lives. And if we are to provide value, we need to find those things that our community members can't do or can't find somebody other than us to do more effectively than we could do. And unless we can find those services, those opportunities, frankly, we have no reason to exist. So we need to figure out what all of this points to. So that's the end of the gloomy stuff. Let's try and, and make it a bit more upbeat. And <clears throat> I will say some nice things about collections now before you send me the same way as, as Boris. When we think about libraries, we think about books because for a large part of history, the information that is at the heart of our service model came in the form of the printed record. But of course, in recent times, if we've been paying attention, we've seen that evolution from print to computer-based to networked information. And my fellow Celtic Fringe member has helped us understand this by building out a collection spectrum. When people think about the content in libraries, they primarily think or traditionally thought about that which we owned, the physical stuff that sat in our shelves that we could touch. That was our collection. And perhaps in a, an emerging current and certainly future state, we need to think more about a facilitated collection, this cloud-based resource. It's a collection that we can borrow from a shared resource. Um, it's a licensed collection, uh, perhaps a shared print collection as part of a broader network, demand-driven collections common with electronic resources, um, the shared digital collection whenever publishers realize that their backs really are against the wall and they need to concede something to keep us happy. Um, the evolving scholarly record, which I'll turn to in a moment, and more broadly, the external collection. This model provokes me in, in, in many ways. It's, it's really fascinating if you delve into it and think about, for example, sunk costs. 
you could argue that our owned collection is a sunk cost in some universities sunk over 300 or more years, um, thinking about future costs, discount rates, and so on. I also wonder where Sci-Hub fits into this, or does that just sit on the fringe not to be talked about? Also, it's really interesting if you get a group of researchers and ask them if they've heard of Sci-Hub, most hands go up. Have they used Sci-Hub? Most hands go up because they have figured out that convenience trumps quality and for our time-starved researchers, that's where they want to go. A recent OCLC report with the Big Ten has helped tease out some of these issues more fully. Um, another useful OCLC model is the collections grid that helps us understand different trajectories. And to me, it's really interesting to think about how in the print environment, libraries really could differentiate their offering to their campus community based on their print collections. And there's a clear relationship between investment and access to information. In a digital world, that has become less differentiated and we see a very different model. Um, I do think that special collections are important. They are becoming a mark of distinction on our campuses. The evolving scholarly record is something that, the, the model that I'll show in a, a moment's time is something that I use in most presentations that I give, most conversations I have with people in our budget office, with faculty on campus. The scholarly record is what matters to a discipline. And the definition of that record, or rather more specifically, the designation of those publications that constitute the record has traditionally been what we librarians have decided. But today, lots of research materials are being generated in digital form, and they are easy and relatively cheap to store, share, and preserve. And developing the skills required to manage that digital scholarly record, and at the same time developing the organizational capacity and institutional incentives required for coordinating that in the way that we might coordinate traditional library collections is something that is profoundly challenging. But let's think for just a moment about the evolving scholarly record and this notion that our traditional focus on the outcomes of research can be expanded to embrace the artifacts of the research process, the data, the community conversations, the algorithms, and so on and the aftermath of the research process, the community review, the open peer review, the reuse of data, and so on. And because the scholarly record is now almost exclusively made up of digital documents, we see it expand in a couple of dimensions. Firstly, because digital documents are easy and cheap to replicate and deliver, um, we see that these broader aspects such as data are becoming an accepted part of the record. I've, I've made that point already. But secondly, that machines can be used to analyze and extend the scholarly record. I've been waiting for years for an event that happened earlier this year when Springer Nature published the first machine-generated book. I wasn't necessarily waiting for Springer to do it, although they were the obvious publisher. But this really important approach of generating a machine-produced overview of literature in a field. I do wonder about what happens at the point when we have a machine-generated review of a bunch of machine-generated reviews and, and so on. <clears throat> it feels a bit like uh, mortgage-backed securities in 2008, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. But the objects that document the research process and its results are increasingly openly visible, but they are scattered around. And that's where stewardship becomes important. And the OCLC report that talks about that conscious coordination as being more important than the invisible hand that we've been able to rely upon until now is important. And we can see some key markers there around generating system-wide awareness, entering into explicit and formal commitments, ensuring that we're not duplicating effort unnecessarily, and ensuring reciprocal access. 
for different members of our communities. In the print-centric environment, um, collections were an attractive part of faculty recruitment. Come to our university because you will have these tremendous resources at your fingertips. But in the digital environment, things are perhaps a little bit different. And we need to understand what that might mean. If we see a series of information resources scattered around servers all over the planet, how do we express that as part of establishing the brand and impact of our libraries? Undoubtedly, at the moment, the most important part of the evolving scholarly record is research data. And funders now recognize that to get the best return on what they invest in the research enterprise, the ability for that data to be produced once, reused, reanalyzed, remixed by other researchers is profoundly important because they don't want to pay for the same original research and the same laboratory equipment over and over again. And from the OCLC work in this space, we've been given pointers to the sorts of services that are important on campus and some of the issues that we need to think through as we wrestle with data management as an increasingly important part of our library mission. But already, I think it's about 10 years since the Australian government said, we are going to impose data mandates. And I think they were one of the first. In the intervening decade, we've seen so much data sharing take place that we are at the point where this notion that I'll sit in my office and find somebody else's data set and reanalyze it and write a new paper feels you know, just very quaint. And we can't lose sight of the power of artificial intelligence and particularly machine learning aspects of AI to help us navigate that a bit more fully. Um, a colleague and I received an NSF grant earlier this year to host a three-day conference on AI and data reuse where we explore these issues more fully. The papers were just published yesterday by ACM and the presentations are on F1000 if you'd like to explore that more fully. And if you want to do more, come and join us in Pittsburgh next May for the second conference. Another um, piece of OCLC's work has been in the sphere of research information management. In the past, in those days when researchers came into our libraries on a regular basis, we could catch them and talk about their latest research, their classes they're teaching and so on as a way of keeping abreast of their information needs and ensuring that our services and collections kept pace with the research and educational enterprise. That opportunity has long since gone. But those libraries that are building research information management systems for their universities have got a new opportunity because we can see the records of our researchers, the publications they're producing, the grants they're receiving, the courses they're teaching, and so on, and use that as a new type of information source to ensure that our libraries keep pace with their needs. And we can do that firstly by understanding the different data sources that come in to our research information system, and secondly, thinking about how we can take that information and allow the university, the researcher, anyone else, to use that content for different purposes, such as faculty annual reports, um, external grant applications, and so on. And I feel that it's important just to, to flag, I don't have time to go into this, the importance of the work that OCLC has done in understanding and advocating for identifiers. Anyone who's tried to populate a research information management system will recognize that without decent identifiers, it's almost an impossible task. So how do we take all of this OCLC work, and there is much more, I've, I've barely scratched the surface. How do we take that and apply it to a university setting? And perhaps inevitably I will use my own institution to try and tease out some of the things we've been doing. Um, we were founded 
1900 by Andrew Carnegie. And one of my um, sound bites periodically is that Carnegie defined the library of the 20th century through his philanthropy and his foundation of two and a half thousand libraries. Interestingly, as a side note, he didn't build one for his own university, but that's another story. Um, but I think it's absolutely fitting that the university that bears his name should try and define the library of the 21st century. I was going to make some Celtic fringe jokes here, but I will save myself and spare you. Um, and think about the university's strategic plan. And inside that, there is a clear university goal around creating a 21st century library. And this is where we come back to our foresight model and think about an action roadmap. And the four pillars of that 21st century library are around learning spaces, global collections, the curation of the scholarly record, and the expertise of information specialists. And these are the sorts of images that I use when I'm talking about this on campus. But for this audience, I feel compelled to reveal my hand and explain that there was not much that was original in this because we simply interrogated the OCLC evidence base and built a strategic plan out of that. So for example, when we think about learning spaces, we need to understand how we fit into the pattern of the student day. What is the inner essence of libraryness to today's students? And if we are to remain a dynamic life force in the educational enterprise, uh, we need space that flexibly accommodates evolving technologies and their usage and become a laboratory for new ways of teaching and learning in the fourth and fifth industrial revolutions that I mentioned earlier. I've said much about collections already. You know, Carnegie Mellon is primarily a computer science and engineering university, so big collections of books are not our core business. But we are growing our focus on distinctive collections that tell our story in different ways. And we've got some absolute gems that I hope you can come and see at some point, Enigma machines, which appeal to our cybersecurity people, Shakespeare first folios, which appeal to our drama students, and so on. But tied into that also is our contribution to that external cloud of content and the tools and services we are building in collaboration with other universities, um, with Birkbeck College on the one hand, with our neighbors at the University of Pittsburgh on the other hand, as a way of ensuring that our university community can effectively contribute. Um, as we turn to curating the scholarly record, our starting point is the world of open science. And we have very firmly built our service portfolio around open science. Um, last year, we had an open science symposium in the libraries, which brought about 200 researchers from around the country. Um, a second one is taking place next month. If you are free on the 7th of November, please come and join us. Um, the starting point for our service framework is inevitably our repository. I told you there were the Scottish traditions that we can't get away from. Think GitHub and kilts and you, you get it. Uh, so this is a comprehensive repository that stores not only publications and dissertations, but code, data, algorithms, all sorts of other resources. And it's becoming a very important part of our research communities work as they collaborate with others around the country. Our campus research information management system um, very much has been built upon the advice from OCLC. We are using symplectic elements. We've recently activated our scholars portal as the external face of that. And we're hiring a new generation of information specialists to work with us. Just as two examples, Anna is um, a neuroscientist who is the, the liaison to our School of Psychology and our Neuroscience Institute, and she directs our Open Science Program. Jun is a cell biologist who is liaison to computational biology, and she leads our reproducible research efforts. So as we think about um, what all of this means, think back to that OCLC report on university futures and the service model. This is our take on the library services that we are offering to our community, very much informed by that evidence base. 
we recognize the proliferation of open science tools that our researchers want to use. And we need to meet them in their workflow, as I said earlier. So if we think about that in the context of the evolving scholarly record at the heart of what we do, and build our service framework, our recognition of the researchers' workflows, we begin to have a framework around which we can build our service model. And there are a gazillion tools that we are promoting in different ways to meet students' and faculty needs. So that is how we have leveraged a foresight planning framework and the resources from OCLC. We need to recognize that it's not, you know, I've, I've given you the upbeat version, but the politics of university campuses can still be difficult. And we know that there are some faculty who value the traditional library model. And one of the most demanding jobs for library leaders in the next decade will be to explain to them why a strategy of perpetuating the past is short-sighted. And we need to build the library of the future. Thank you.